<laughs> Welcome to Biff's Mystery Theater. I have many tales to tell you. Ghost stories, murder stories, and tales that will make your bones chill. <laughs> Join me, won't you? For theater of the mind, where you always have the best seat in the house. <laughs> Now close your eyes and turn off the lights. <laughs> Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. You're acquainted, of course, with the game of chess. So absorbing a game of skill that Thomas Fuller wrote, when a man's house is on fire, it's time to break off chess. If you play the game, you understand what he meant. Luck plays no part in it. Mistakes do. Caused by the superior strategy of your opponent. You're attacked. You retreat and form your defenses for the king. Can he be saved from checkmate? Life is like that, isn't it? Had Jeff Powers made a mistake, or had he been outmaneuvered? Tim Whelan, an insurance investigator, wants to know. Is this the missing diamond, Jeff? Where did you get that, Mr. Whelan? From the bottom of your cigarette package. Well, that's impossible. Security at Mordley & Son is thorough and very tight. Well, it should be. We're one of the biggest jewelry stores in the city, and a lot of gems have been stolen in the past few years. But I'm not the thief, Mr. Whelan. I swear before... No, me. no, no need to. I know you're not, Jeff. I also know who is. And I'm afraid it'll give you a bad turn. Our mystery story, Your Move, Mr. Ellers, was written especially for Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Jack Grimes and Bobby Reddick. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In many ways, life is like a game of chess. For instance, what else could be meant by putting your best foot forward? All of us try to do just that, appear at our best to others, evaluate the other person in advance so he doesn't think you're overly confident, arrogant. Again, to repeat, very much like a game of chess. You must think about your opponent because he's thinking about you. And one thoughtless move can be your ruin. Another costly gem has been stolen from the showroom of Maudley and Son. Gentle old Mr. Ellers is distressed. This is terrible. Terrible, Mr. Whalen. Well, my company is very upset. Of course, it's understandable. We may have to refuse to renew the insurance policy. What? Maudley and Son is the most respect... Yes, yes, we realize that. But these unsolved thefts have cost us tens of thousands of dollars over the past few years. Your company has become a bad risk. Yes, all of us are aware of that. I don't really know what to say. I've worked for the firm for 35 years. Proudly, our reputation... But we won't go into that. It's the times... Years ago, it was unthinkable that anyone would steal from us. Today, today, an emerald worth $30,000 was stolen from a showcase. Your security officers swear that no outsider pocketed the gem. Now, they've said that before. And they're honest men. We know, we've checked. The thief, Mr. Ellis, is an employee. Oh, every one of us is thoroughly inspected before we leave the store. It's embarrassing, but necessary. How? How is it done? I'm still trying to find out. You've talked with each of our employees, I know. 
I'll vouch for every one of them. So will Mr. Motley and his son. Members of our staff are carefully screened. They're dedicated to our kind of work. They admire our products, appreciate the beauty and craftsmanship of our gems. Yes, yes, I've talked with each of them. Mr. Ellis, tell me about Jeff Powers. You certainly don't suspect Jeff. I suspect everyone. But not Jeff. He's exceptional. I expect that young man to advance quickly in the firm. He's bright, direct, and personable. Yes, I agree. I'm very fond of him. We share an enthusiasm for chess. You mustn't suspect my chess companion. I noticed the men set up on your side of the table. Oh, Jeff and I often have a game at lunchtime over a sandwich and coffee. He's quite a good player. Chess is our hobby. I enjoy the game, Mr. Ellis. Do you? Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear it. We should play sometime. Jeff and I belong to Check and Mate, a private chess club. If you'd like to be my guest... Well, thank you, whenever you're free. Well, this Wednesday I'll be at the club after dinner, say, 9 o'clock. Fine. And the address? I'll write it down for you. Now, well, these are fine, big chess pieces. The classic Staunton kind. Wooden. I like the feel. Here you are. It'll be a pleasure to see you, especially after this unpleasant morning. How, how do we solve the unsolvable? Well, the stolen gems didn't fly away, Mr. Ellis. And none of the staff has an artificial limb. Good heavens, you've thought of that. And many other possibilities. Such as? Well, I think it's better if I keep my own counsel. Or I could turn you into a spy. But I want to help. I know that. Just be reassuring to everyone. Keep your eyes and ears open. Given time, the thief will give himself away. He hasn't so far. True. But we now have detailed information on everyone who works here. By a process of elimination, I've reduced the suspects to only a few. And you have made progress. I'll tell Mr. Maudley. He'll be pleased. I've already told him. He wasn't pleased at all. Mr. Whalen. Well, hello, Mr. Powers. Well, that was some grilling you gave us this morning at the store. You're the last person I expected to see here. Well, Mr. Ellis invited me to have a game with him at nine. I'm a little early. Are you playing? No, I, I just finished. Mr. Ellis should be through uh, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Who's the man he's playing with now? Oh, it's an old pal of his, Will Minton. They're regular opponents. Now, uh, Minton's big on the Queen Gambit decline opening, but Ellis defends well against anything. He's uh, pretty tough. Now, Ellis and I talked about you and your chess games at lunch. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, nothing else? <laughs> no, I'm not telling you if that's what's got you back up. Uh, I'm sorry, but all of us at Maudley are uh, pretty uptight. Well, so am I. An insurance investigator is supposed to produce results. Yeah, I understand. Uh, where are you, or uh, can't you say? I think I have a clue. Well, can I be of help? No, oh, I, I, I don't. I don't mean spying on the others, but uh, oh, I don't know. Talking about the staff, my impressions. Uh, isn't that kind of thing useful? Yeah, I know it is in books. It's very useful. I appreciate your offer, Mister Powers. Uh, make it, Jeff. Huh? Well, I'm Tim. You know, it, it, it bugs me. It uh, really does. Marley is a fine firm, and these gem thefts kind of tarnish its reputation. Now, it has to be one of us employees, and that's creepy. I've got thought and thought about it, and I'm, I'm nowhere. You say you've got a clue. That beats me. Well, it's my job. The thefts have been going on for years, and only today did I see a glimmer of light. Oh? I'd like to take you up on your offer to chat. What if I drop around after my game with your boss? Well, sure. You uh, uh, know where I live. I know where everyone on the staff lives. Mm. What he does, spends, and many more things besides. Okay, then I'll wait up for you. Oh, I'll say goodnight to Ella's. Uh, game's over. Minton's laid his king on his side, and... Yeah, there he is, bringing his captured pieces out of his pocket. Ella's is now ready for you. Come on. I haven't seen that before. What, Minton pocketing the pieces he's captured? He always does that with everyone. That's a little crazy. Evening, Mr. Ellis. Ah, Jeff and Mr. Whalen. Mr. Whalen, Will Minton, Will Minton, my worthy though vanquished foe. Well, I'm glad to make your acquaintance. Thanks. You playing this tricky old devil? Well, when you make a stupid mistake, Will, you say I'm tricky. Chess is the complete game, and luck plays no part in it. 
You're so impetuous, bulling and flailing away, but you don't intimidate me. I wait until you've overextended yourself, and then I strike. I've been playing for 30 years, and I still have to listen to Edward Ellis' little sermons of chess truth. <laughs> and then I strike. I ask you, is he far out? Well, how about a game with me, Will? That's an idea. One condition. Mm -hmm. If you win, which is unlikely, oh. no 30-second sermons. Agreed? Absolutely. I've heard all of them. He hands me one at least twice a week. <laughs> There's nothing worse than losing a game of chess. Sit down, Mr. Whalen. Well, which hand do you choose? Yeah, my closed hand. The left. Ah, the white piece. Let me turn the board around. There we are. Handsome, aren't they? Quite new. At least some of the pieces are. Oh, they get hard use. The club replaces the worn or broken ones. All right, sir. Begin. Well, well. Pawn to King Four. One more, Will? Not tonight, young man. Bloodthirsty, aren't you? Ah, uh -huh, lucky. <laughs> you heard what Ellers said. Except for who picks the white pieces and begins, there's no luck in chess. I played like a dummy. Uh, by the way, uh, huh? who's the guy with Ellers? He introduced him as Tim Whalen, prospective member. Well, I don't know, maybe. He's an insurance investigator. Did Mr. Ellers tell you about the latest at Maudley's? Yeah. Someone copped an emerald for one of the showcases. Well, it's a big firm. Got to expect the loss now and then. Whalen give you a going over? Oh, boy, me and everyone else. Mr. Ellis told me that our insurance may not be renewed. It's kind of a slur on Maudley, and you know how Mr. Ellis feels about the firm. Ah, uh, it's his life. Oh, uh, what does Whalen say? Does he think he knows who pinched the emerald? Oh, not yet, but he did say he had a clue. He told you that? Yeah, he, he wouldn't talk about it, naturally. Naturally. Well, we all have our troubles. I'll see you another evening, Jeff. Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for the game. Uh, good night, now. By the way, Jeff, mm -hmm? uh, have you any idea who stole the emerald? What? Don't get that expression on your face. I know you didn't swipe it. I should hope not. If I did, I'd report it. That's why I asked the question. Don't. Don't. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Someone has a lot at stake. The thief. If he or she suspects that you or anyone else knows him, you could get wiped out. What? <laughs> You're not serious, Will. But I am. Rather than risk exposure, the thief might act so. Ignorance is bliss. Hey, you are serious, aren't you? Very. I know you like your job. But would you give up your life for Maudley and Son? Hi. Come on in, Tim. Thanks. Well, nice place. I won't take up much of your time. Oh, that's all right. Eh? Uh, please sit down. Uh, by the way, how'd you make out with Mr. Ellis? Well, I'm proud to say I played him to a draw. Hey, you must be good. And he's a cautious player, but so am I. We both played well. Well, I'd like to play a game with you sometime. Well, we'll do it. I, um... I don't know quite how to begin. Well, uh, at the beginning, of course. No, I think not. I'm going to make you angry. Oh, you are? <laughs> Why? Because you're straight and loyal. I don't get you. What do you know about Will Minton? Well, I'll be darned. I, uh, I didn't expect a question like that. Well, tell me what you know about him. Well, I like him. He's rough, but he's bright. Uh, Will's in the import-export business. Uh, somewhere in the downtown area. And he and Ella's are good friends. Well, the best. Uh, Will's a chess bug, too. They've known each other for uh, years. Well, Will Mitten is another hobby. That you wouldn't know anything about. No, I, I don't know him well, personally. He's a fence. A receiver of stolen goods? Receiver and disposer. The police know about him, and so do I. How about that? So? He specializes in stolen gems. Ah, oh, I see. 
So he's the clue you mentioned. He doesn't know me, but I recognized him. Minton's well known for slick deals. Many a stolen gem finds its way into his hands and into Antwerp, where it's cut up. And so far, he hasn't been caught. And you think he has the emerald stolen from Montley's? Yes. Where did he get it? Who gave it to him? If you're thinking what I think you're thinking, I guess you've taken up all of your time. Well, I haven't made an accusation, Jeff. Not yet. Yes, but your inference is obvious. Edward Ellis. Ah, you're spaced out. Mr. Ellis is the most trusted employee at the firm. Forget it. I respect him and I love the old man. Danny, he's not so old. He's not 60 yet. You can't suspect him. If you even hinted at it, both Mr. Marley and his son would throw you out. You wouldn't have a chance to cancel the insurance. They'd cancel it. Quite a speech. And now that you've got all that off your chest, you think you can listen to reason? You've made your statement. Can you listen to mine? Loyalty is a virtue, but sometimes loyalty, like love, is blind. And if it isn't reciprocal, if a loyal person discovers that he has been deceived, he is stunned, angered, and filled with hatred. He feels diminished. Can we trust anyone? Of course. But each of us, I'm sure, has experienced betrayal. And it's hard to believe. And it makes us angry. More on the subject when I return with Act Two. person's good name and makes him poor indeed is a universal truth because it obtains every day in every walk of life. A rumor can ruin a man's business career and a well-placed hint has destroyed marriages. And this viewpoint applies here. Jeff Powers is loyal to old Edward Ellers. Is that loyalty well-founded? It would seem to be. The insurance investigator Tim Whalen has by inference filched from the good name of Mr. Ellers because of his association with a man named Will Minton. Hello. Yeah. All right, I'll be there. What's up? Judas, you don't dare. Not so soon after. How big? They'll go crazy. Police all over the place. Can't we wait a month or so? Jeff told me last night that Whalen has a clue. Yeah. Any idea what it could be? What? Jeff, you pin it on him? Yeah, it should work. And I'll meet you at the club. When? Eight? Okay. Now remember, bring out the queen rook as soon as you can. Yes, I'll have it with me. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Well, Mr. Whalen, can I sell you anything? A string of matched pearls, the newest Swiss watch? Or do you want to hear that Mr. Helm over there across the aisle wears a vest and has been dropping jewels into it every time my back is turned? I have this mirror, you see. Uh, and don't, I... don't waste your sarcasm on me, Jeff. Are you still angry? Uh, you're bad news. I suspect you're in for a great big shock, Jeff. I told you I just couldn't spy on Mr. Ellis. He's a friend he thought I was spying on him, he'd be horrified and, and hurt. You played chess with him? You know that. You're playing in his office today at lunchtime. Well, I guess so. Well, enjoy yourself. How can I with your lousy suspicion stuck in my mind? Well, then you do share it, huh? Neither, not at all, but you planted it in my mind and it, it sits there. Well, then do what I asked. I can't. He'd wonder right away. I'm... No good at being devious. Now, what's devious about examining the chess pieces? Well, I've never done it before. We play. I capture a piece and place it on the table next to the board and wait for his move. Now, how can I pick up the captured piece and turn it upside down and study it? You think I'm nuts? Not if he's innocent. Well, you do what your conscience tells you to do. I'm sorry if I've distressed you, but my job is to arrest a jewel thief. I've got the accomplice pegged. And his very good friend is Edward Ellers. The natural conclusion... Look, why don't you get lost? Are you loyal to the firm 
Or to Ellis. You want to protect one man at the expense of the others? You have nothing on Ellis, and you know it. Confront him. Make your charge against him. Examine the chess pieces yourself. Why not? If I show my hand too quickly, I'll come up with a blank. Oh. Don't you think that Ellis, as a chess player, has anticipated any move I might make? Well, of course he has. That's why I need your help. Now, it's your privilege to refuse. Then I'll have to work through Will Minton. Well, you do that. I don't want any part of your dirty scheme. Okay. Don't get caught on the switches. And what's that supposed to mean? Well, if Ellis feels that I've got a clue to the identity of the thief, he'll act. <laughs> I see. Ellis wonders about your interest in me, suspects that I might be dangerous in some dark and gloomy night, shoots me with a gun with a silencer. You know something, Tim? Except that all of this is so ugly, I find it funny. Now, don't make that mistake. It isn't funny at all. Very well played, Jeff. I congratulate you. You've been studying. Oh, little... My end game is getting stronger, isn't it? Oh, much, much. Very good defense. Good. I may say so again. What you must do is never to forget the cardinal rule of once attacked, once defended. You know that, but like Will, you sometimes become impetuous. I enjoyed our game. How about another cup of coffee? Well, me too. Now, I'll get them, Mr. Ellis. Not only a good chess player, but a gentleman, too. Well, I won't be but a minute. Take your time. It's only one o'clock. Hi. Have a good game? Oh, no. You again. I told you to get lost, Tim. Yes, I know. I'm hard of hearing. Okay, now what? Did you look at the pieces? No, I did not. I'm on my way to get some coffee. You want a cup? We'll have it in Ella's office, and you can hold him while I search everything. Are, um... You gonna be a check and mate tonight? Don't tell me you're coming around again. Yes, I think so. Uh, careful with those cups. You spill it. I know what I'd like to do with them. Thank you, Jeff. Just what I needed. Mm. By the way, was that Whalen out there? I thought I noticed him through my door. Yeah, it was Whalen, all right. He's always out there. It seems he's, he's driving all of us crazy. Oh, dear. That's not right, is it? He's a very conscientious man. I know he's determined that this time he'll capture the thief, but I don't want him to harass the staff. Uh, where do I leave my cigarettes? Oh, the chess table. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Ellis, you, you were saying? I'll speak to Mr. Whalen. He's turned all of us inside out and he's found nothing. I'll ask him to drop the investigation until he has a lead, and that may be never. Well, he has some kind of clue. Oh? Well, he said so last night at check and made. That's so? Oh. Well, that's encouraging. What is it, Jeff? Do you know? Uh, no, sir. You don't say that with much conviction. Well, that's because I think he's talking to his hat. It, he, he thinks there's a thief and someone who disposes of what's stolen. A fence? A matter of fact, yes. Did, do you know about that kind of thing? Uh, fences? Or every knowledgeable jeweler does. Would you believe that at one time, Will Minton was such a man? Will? Why, I thought he was in the import-export business. He is, entirely. It was a very long time ago. Will's been my friend for over 25 years. Back in the early 50s, he was out of work. A man he'd gone to school with turned out to be a petty thief. Borrowed money from Will in exchange for a stolen watch. Will sold it at a profit and... For a while, he was in business. I'd never guess. Don't mention it. This is confidential, Jeff. Oh, of course, of course. I take credit for making Will come to his senses. I helped him get started in the import-export business. You can be sure he's very glad that I did. The fence business is far behind him. He'd burn a hand before he'd handle stolen goods. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. I knew Whalen was off his rocker. Oh? He has his eye on Will? I uh, think so. And I certainly will speak to Whalen. I don't want Will to have his past raked up and to be embarrassed by it. You know what that could do. Ruin his business. Uh, let me see. One thirty. We'd better get back to work. Good game, Jeff. Thank you for the chat. I'll make quick work of Mr. Whalen. 
Good gracious. Mr. Ellis, you know what that means. What's gone? Well, security says it's that Indian ruby worth 50000 It's missing from Mr. Helm's showcase. Helm? It's impossible. He's been framed. All the same, every one of us will have to be searched. This is an outrage. Yeah, well, I sure agree. And only a day after the emerald disappeared. We'll have to go through a lie detector test. Oh, that's humiliating. And... Think of the devil. Uh, what are you doing here? Oh, snooping around. I, uh, walked in just as the alarm went off. We're sick and tired of your snooping, Mr. Whalen. I intend to recommend to Mr. Maudley that you be removed from your investigation. You haven't been very effective, and you've begun to harass the members of our staff. You're right, Mr. Ellers. I have failed. I'll withdraw from the case. And you'll also, I hope, withdraw your suspicions about Will Minton. He has a record, it's true, but he's been straight as an arrow ever since he went into business. I told him, Tim. Now, that's obvious. Now, that's what I call service. This is going to be a new experience for me. Along with everyone else, I'm going to be searched. Then maybe I'll be allowed to help the police. Well... Are you satisfied, Mr. Whalen? Completely. Why are you so upset? Wouldn't you rather be searched by me than by a strange cop? No matter who searches me, it's an indignity. Now may I put my clothes on? Yes, and then you may go. Are you next? I'll go when I please, Mr. Whalen. Don't forget, this is my office. Okay, all right. Stick around. Now get going, Jeff. Down to the shorts. Give me your coat, then your trousers, socks, and shoes. Okay, the coat. Uh, you better check inside the lining. I've got the ruby taped in there with a band-aid. Well, I don't think that hasn't been tried. Uh, the coat seems to be all right. Wallet, pen and pencil set, cigarettes in your handkerchief pocket. Perhaps you should cut open each cigarette, Mr. Whalen. An ideal hiding place for a jewel. Well, that's a thought. For gosh no, sake. No, 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 no. Mr. Ellers has a very clever idea, but I'm not going to go through 15 cigarettes right now. Later. Uh, you're going to keep the cigarettes? Uh, let's have the rest. Trousers and then... I know, I know, I know. Absurd. Jeff, if you'll excuse me, I'll see you at the club. Uh, y yes, sir. All right. Put your clothes on. Huh? Well, what about... Forget this? your clothes. I have what I want. I want to examine those chest pieces. That's how you got to examine this. But the police are in on this. Of course, we work together. I told them about my hunch, and they said play it. I don't see anything here. Maybe that's good. Well, just what are you looking for? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. If you knew what I'd found already, you'd go through the ceiling. You found something? If I hadn't, you'd be in jail. Oh, you're really too much. No. These pieces are okay. Where's the phony one? Jeff. No, no, no. I don't have to ask. You... You came out for coffee about one o'clock. Yeah, that, that's when it was done. But how? Jeff, give me a straight answer. Where do the employees hang their coats when they come to work? Uh, we've got lockers downstairs. And the executives? Well, they have closets in their offices. Uh, that's Ellers over there. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. He didn't wear a coat when he just left. Yeah, but he brought one to work. I know that. I saw him wearing it when he went in to see Mr. Maudley at 5 o'clock. He was prepared to go home. But I found the two of you in here just before the burglar alarm went off. Well, Mr. Ellers came back to get some kind of report from Mr. Maudley. What, what, what's wrong with that? Everything. So when he left a few minutes ago, he returned to Maudley's office and picked up his coat. Well, sure, I, I suppose so. I know so. And then he just slipped away into the trap. Well, sure. Now, you still don't see it, do you? No, obviously you don't. When Ellers left the store, that ruby left with him. Will you trust me, Jeff? Go ahead. Invite me to check and mate tonight for a game of chess. No? Okay. I think I know how it's done. But I want to see for myself. Now I'd better alert the police. It is only natural that men who are avid chess players carry their kind of thinking over into the game of life. So far, Mr. Ellers seems to be playing the white pieces and is the aggressor. 
Tim Whelan, several times over the years, has had to resign. This time, however, he seems to know his opponent's strategy. We'll find out more when I return shortly with Act Three. There's a 13th century proverb, opportunity makes a thief. That's true enough, I'm sure, but it takes a certain kind of mentality in a man or woman to make stealing a career. I leave the explanation to the psychiatrists. Is a person born a thief, or do conditions make him resort to thievery? Under certain circumstances, even an honest man will steal. But what about our Mr. Ellers? Is he a thief? If so, why? And what about his reformed friend, Will Minton? Why, Jeff. Oh, hi. Well, you look as if you'd seen a ghost, Will. What's the matter? Nothing. It surprised me, so. Oh. I thought you, all of you, would be stuck for hours with the police. Oh, you heard the latest. How'd you find out? Was it on the news? Why, uh, Ellis told me. He called me at home. Said he might be late because of what happened. Oh, is, is he here? Yeah, in the game room. Just went in. I stopped at the bar here. Is he all right? Why shouldn't he be? Well, he was very upset when he left his office. Two thefts in one week. The police found nothing? No, and they made a thorough search. All of us had to strip, even Mr. Ellis. <laughs> I'll bet he liked that. Yeah, not much. But he sure was angry with Whalen. The insurance guy? Mm. You say uh, he searched Ellis? And me. He said it was okay with the police. Well, uh, I'll see you later. Yeah, if I'm here. Uh, how about a game, Will? Uh, and not tonight. After I play Ellers, I have to run along. Some other time, thanks just the same. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, have a good game. Oh, Will, thank you. How thoughtful. Guess who's here, Edward? The ghost of Christmas past? Jeff Powers. That's so extraordinary. That's how it struck me. What went wrong? I don't know. Let's uh, begin the game. Make a pretense play. We better call it off. Can't. You may not have another chance. I'll play the black pieces. Jeff said that Will and searched him and you. Yes, a humiliating experience. What about Will? So, pawn to king four. Conventional. Well, Will, persistent but not much imagination. Jeff told me that Wayland has a clue. I doubt that. Let's not prolong this, Will. Surprise me in 15 minutes. It is the Queen's Rook. As prearranged, yes. They're playing now? In the game room. Anyone else playing? Well, two guys I haven't seen before. I don't know who they are. Good. That's a funny thing to say, Tim. You know, your cloak and dagger routine gives me a pain. Well, of course it does. The kind of work I do is alien to most persons who essentially are trusting. I'm not, because I can't be. You should be able to understand that. Uh, that's a lousy way to make a living. Well, it's not much different than being a doctor. Oh, oh, come off it, Tim. No, I'm serious. Crime is a disease. Without the police or a guy like me, you wouldn't sleep comfortably tonight. Well, I won't anyway. Oh, yes, you will. Just the case will be closed within a very few minutes. You mean you... You know who's been stealing the gems? Yep. And I intend to prove it. Well, if you know who it is... I want to catch the thief in the act. You came here tonight to make the arrest? No, I don't have the authority to arrest anyone. The police will make the arrest. I came here to watch Ellers and Will Minton play a game of chess. You can't even see them from this bar area. I realize that. I realized that earlier when I knew Ellers suspected I might have found the clue to the thefts. I wish you hadn't told him I found a clue... Until then, he thought I was just a bumbling amateur detective. Well, he asked me. It's all, right. I... it's all right. It's all right. No great damage done. Only it did prevent me from watching for myself. And what would you be watching for? The transfer of that ruby from the thief to the pets. Ellers to Minton. Well, how was it done? D do you know? Yes. When a chess player captures a piece, he sets it down behind the chessboard. Not Minton. Well, that's true. For some reason, he shoves the pieces into his pocket and... 
him. You got it? Think about the number of new chessmen that replace old or broken ones here at the club. And then picture the chess set in Ella's office. Are all the pieces equally worn? Sometimes isn't there a new knight, king, or rook? Genius. Especially when the thief is the most trusted man in the firm. Tim, you're not going to arrest him in the club. Certainly not. It's a fine old club. You don't want it harmed by publicity, and neither do I. Now, there are two strangers in the game room right now. Two plain clothesmen. Uh, one of your plain clothesmen has just come out. Yes, he's leaving. So is the other man. Well, they got what they wanted. What are you doing here, Mr. Whalen? Well, Jeff invited me. Did he indeed? After what this man has put us through, Jeff, I should think you'd have better taste. May I buy you something from the bar, Jeff? No, uh, thank you, Mr. Ellis. I, I was about to leave. You mean you and Whalen have already played? No, we intend to, but Jeff's a bit depressed. So am I. Edward, I'll say goodnight. Busy day tomorrow. My uh, top coat... I know which one it is, the Chesterfield. That's right. Next to Jeff's reversible, you'll find the book about the end game in my left-hand coat pocket. Thank you, Edward. Good night. Good night, Jeff. If you'd like a game, Jeff. Uh, no, sir. I, I really am kind of done in. I'll, uh, I'll uh, be getting, getting along. Very slow here tonight. Can't understand it. I'll see you in the morning. Tim, when does the action begin? By now, it may be over. Are you susceptible to colds? You flipped. Are you? No. You're the weirdest gumshoe I ever heard of. Since when is my health a factor and who's got the $50,000 ruby? I wanted to know because I'm pretty sure that your reversible top coat has been appropriated. <laughs> you don't make any sense. Ellers is a cagey player. He tipped off Will Minton to get rid of the chess piece. Now, Ellers missed once today. This was his second chance. To do what? Put you behind bars? While we're waiting in Captain O'Hara's office, I have a surprise for you, Jeff. Swell. Have a cigarette. Yeah, but you don't smoke. Is this your brand? Yeah. Well, the package is yours. I thought I'd return it. Oh. Well, thanks. I remove all the cigarettes. Okay. Look, uh, how long are we going to play games? I, I, I'm exhausted. I want to go home and hit the sack. Now, tip the cigarette package upside down. Okay. And what do you find? Damn, what? A, a diamond? Good for you. It is a diamond. It's the one taken from Mr. Helm's showcase and placed in your cigarette package where it was supposed to be found. No. When you stepped out of Ella's office for coffee, he slipped the diamond into the package. Remember his suggestion that I cut open the cigarettes, he said it in a very superior manner. But his intention was very clear. He was leading me by the nose with a stolen diamond. A diversion. If you had been found with the diamond, you'd also be suspected of having stolen the ruby. And that would have made it much simpler for Ellis to have left with it. Mr. Ellis set out to frame me? What else would you call it? A shock? Worse than that. Almost as bad as if my father had double-crossed me. Mr. Ellis taught me everything I know about the jewelry business. He's been my friend. Quite a joke to find out he's got sticky fingers. Hey, you know something, Tim? You've talked pretty big for the last hour. You want proof? Well, the police have it. That's why they let me use this office. I wanted to talk with you alone and uncover this planet evidence prepare you for the ugly truth about gentle, clever Mr. Edward Ellers. Now let me show you something else. Here. Examine it. It's a black rook. Where'd you get it? From one of these strangers at your club. The cops? That's right. Now examine the bottom of the chest piece. So? Bring a little pressure on the bottom of your thumb. I'll be done. Understand? It, it's hollowed out and there's, uh, there's cotton in it. And in the cotton was that stolen ruby. Incredible. It sure is. That's why Ellis and Mitten have made a fool of me for years. Yes? Fine, send him in. You mean Mr. Ellis stole gems and, and hid them in one of the chess pieces? Exactly. Then he'd substitute a new piece for the one with the false bottom. 
Walk out with a stolen piece and make another exchange at your chess club with Will Minton, a well-known fence. But Mr. Ellis said that Will's been straight for over 20 years. And you believe everything that Ellis says? Am I right? Yes, I do. Come in, Mr. Ellis. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Ellis and I have to finish the game. Don't we, Mr. Ellis? Is this necessary, Mr. Whalen? Don't you think you owe Jeff an apology? He's disappointed in me, I feel certain, because I usually win. Oh, I see what you mean, because I took his reversible coat. Which the police took, and in which they found this. Those two strangers at the club. A move I overlooked. Will cautioned me, but I had to take a chance. One never should. You'd do well to remember that, Jeff. This is unreal, Tim. Just as a matter of curiosity, Mr. Whalen, may I ask what gave you a clue? Two facts. First, as the firm's oldest and most trusted member, you were not suspect. Second, Will Minton's habit of stuffing captured chess pieces into his pocket. And, of course, the new chess pieces, the new black rook in your office set, a new black one here on the board where you and Minton played tonight. And then you overextended yourself about Jeff's cigarette package. Mm. I underestimated you, I'm afraid. I've denied everything, of course. Well, the police expected that, but you won't get away with it. Will is a known fence. My reputation is sterling. You've recovered the ruby, and I assume Will was seen slipping the black rook into Jeff's reversible coat. So he'll do time in prison. I won't. There's no way you can prove that I had any connection with the theft. What if you've already proven it yourself? Don't speak in riddles, Mr. Whalen. All right, how about this? Remember your conversation with Will before you began to play? Well, the police have that on tape, Mr. Ellis. Have they really? That's right. And we will, of course, check further into your financial status. You seem to be an affluent man. Where's your share of the sales returns? Banked in Antwerp? Probably. Easy to find out. Mitten will supply it. Oh, uh, your move, Mr. Allen. I have none. Checkmate? Checkmate. <laughs> The origin of chess is lost in obscurity. Its invention has been ascribed to the Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Persians. Who originated it? We have a famous array ranging from King Solomon to Aristotle to the Brahmin Sissa and the celebrated Persian astronomer Chakrensha. The game never loses its appeal because its moves parallel our own in life. As Mr. Ellers found out, I shall return shortly. Ellers and Minton, of course, were imprisoned for a very long time, where the former could ponder something Thomas Huxley wrote a hundred years ago. He speaks of a chess player's opponent, and he says, we know that his play is always fair, just, and patient, but also we know, to our cost, that he never overlooks a mistake or makes the smallest allowance for ignorance. And... That pretty well describes our persistent insurance investigator, Tim Whalen. So, a small bow to him. Our cast included Jack Grimes, Bobby Reddick, Roger DeCoven, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. That's my name. That's me. You? <laughs> Why, that's... That, that's my name, Harold Kenneth Starbright. That's who I am. Well, obviously, it's, it's a coincidence. Harold Kenneth Starbright, born July 1st, 1937. That's my birthday. Well, died. Look. Look at that date. Look. Died March 15th, 1978. March 15th, 1978? 
How's that possible? I, I, I don't understand. March 15th, 1978 hasn't happened yet. Is, is that what's going to happen to me? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I discovered that it was Lord Byron in his famous poem, Don Juan, who first said, For truth is always strange, stranger than fiction. Others, I'm sure, have said it in their own ways. Edmund Burke, the great British statesman and orator, phrased it, Truth lags behind fiction. And Bob Ripley, the cartoonist, made a life work and a fortune out of this simple statement. The following story is fiction. But it is founded on a strange truth. That nice little lady, she couldn't commit a murder over a cat. Let me tell you something, Detective Trout. Most murders are committed by otherwise nice people. And motive? Sometimes all it takes is a hot night or a sneeze or the wrong words put together. Don't you ever forget it, Ms. Detective. The right time, the right place, the right circumstances. Anyone can commit homicide. Our mystery drama, Checkmate, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Robert Dryden and Marion Haley. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. <laughs> Detective Sergeant Digger Bowles of the 4th Precinct is looking forward to his approaching retirement from the force. In his nearly 30 years in the police department, over 20 of them as a plainclothes detective, he's been happy and proud in his work. But uh, he's a man of habit, and change irritates him more and more. Most of all, this new breed of officers. He doesn't particularly appreciate it when they come in a form that is anathema to him in the hallowed precincts of the station house. A fourth precinct, Detective Trout. Help! Help! I, I'm murdered! Well, hold it a minute. Uh, who are you? So, Fender. Address and phone number? Well, eight, seven, four, five. Wait, was that a five or a nine? A five. I didn't get that last. Please. Mr. Fender. Uh, Mr. Fender. Are you all right? Hello? Where you got that, Detective? The big one, Sergeant Foles. Homicide. Who says? The guy on the phone. What guy? Who? Saul Fender. He just got murdered. Who got murdered? Saul Fender, the man on the phone. The victim called up to say he was being murdered. No. That he just had been. I got the address. We'd better go over there right away. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean he's still on the phone? He was. He isn't anymore. Here, listen. Hello? Hello? Mr. 
Fender. Mr. Fender. You see, he was talking, and then I heard him fall, but he said he'd been murdered. I don't know, Trout. My feet are killing me. I just hope this isn't somebody's idea of a joke. All right, come on. Let's go see. Why don't you use the siren? Because I ain't no show-off. Besides, it makes too much noise. Disturbs people, including me. Yes, but it's important to get there. We'll get there. Fast. Just as fast. Well, how do you know? Because I've been driving this city just uh-huh. this way for, for 25, 25 years, years and, and it's, it's always been... been good enough. Smart, huh? Mm-hmm. Now, what do you know? You're just beginning. You think this is a game? No, I don't. I'm just enthusiastic about my job, and I'd like to be good at it. Just like. Don't enthuse. You don't like me, do you, Digger? Did I say that? Well, you don't have to. You think I'm just a wet-behind-the-ears young tongue. Don't tell me what I think, Detective Trout. Uh Uh-huh, well, then you tell me. I think... I know you're a dame. That's all. And dames don't have any place in your thinking. Not on the force. Well, not in homicide, anyway. (laughs) Why? Women get killed, too. Yeah, that's right. So maybe it's just lucky we're at the scene of the crime that's already been committed. All right, come on. Let's go play cop. Now, just let me get this straight, Miss... uh... Apple Oh, yeah. Mm. You say you're out walking your dog. Cat. Cat. Yeah. Cat. Walking a cat. Sure. <laughs> he likes his evening stroll, Marsters. What do you think? He looks like a dog, that cat? You see a leash, you figure a dog at the other end. <laughs> and you're a detective. Maybe I'm too busy looking at that weapon in your other hand. What's that for? Oh, this neighborhood. A person isn't safe even if it's still light. Nobody bothers me no more since I stuck a couple of them with this. What is it? It's a hat pin. Madam, that's a dangerous weapon. You have to tell me. Mrs. Apfelbaum, how come when we got here you were with the dead man? He was the super. I, I had a complaint. Uh, and you usually just walk right into his apartment to complain? Listen, Miss Cop. Usually I can't even get him to answer the bell when all the things need fixing. Plumbing, heat, the cockroaches. And yesterday, even the toilets wouldn't flush. You don't like Mr. Fender? Anybody doesn't like cats. Can't be any good. God forgive me for saying that, and the poor man dead. He was dead when you came in? Just like you see him. What time was this? Oh, I guess a few minutes after nine. I I got a watch, but I I couldn't see without my glasses. How did you get in, Mrs. Applebaum? Well, I just turned the handle and the door opened. So anyone could have got in, huh? I guess, if they had the new key. What new key? Well, to the outside door. Well, we got a new lock. Burglar proof, it's supposed to be. <laughs> I'd still like to see the day. Well, uh, how many people have keys to the outside lock? Oh, just the people in the building. Unless they had copies made. Oh, first off, you can't. You've got to send to the company. And second, we all just got them this morning. Who's all? I mean, who else is in the building? Oh, well, you see, there's that driver person on the first floor back. Me, second floor front. And Miss Dimby, second back. And the doctor on third floor back. The doctor? Oh, that's what we all call Mr. Porter. Oh, is he smart? He plays chess with eight, ten people at a time and wins from them all. Yeah, right in the window there at, at Boardwalk and 52nd Street. He, he does what? Yeah, I know where she means. It's an amusement palace. Pinball machine, skeet ball, shooting gallery, and Professor Porter, the human chess machine. You pay to play him. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Mrs. Applebaum. Yes, honey. Uh, there are six apartments in this building. Who occupies the other two? Well, the, the first floor front is Mr. Kelly with the birds. He had to go back in the hospital again, so I'm caring for them. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But what about the sixth one? Oh, that, that's Mr. Brillantine. 
Brilliantine. You know him? Hey, Lance Brilliantine. He, he's an actor person. What does he do? Hair commercials? Oh, no, no, no. He's with the children's theater now. They, they do fairy stories. And he just flew up to Boston and he's looking to sublet. He has the whole top floor through. That's nice. A little nest in the treetops. Well, thanks, Mrs. Applebaum. You go on up to your apartment and stick around. We might want to question you again. Oh, I'm not going anywhere. But... Uh, what about poor Mr. Fender? He ain't going anywhere either. Yeah, but sh shouldn't he have a doctor? The only one he'll need is a medical examiner. Oh. How he died, that's up to the M.E. Now, nah, you run along, huh? Oh, yes, of course, Sergeant. Hey, hey, watch that thing. My hat, then? Oh, don't worry. I know how to handle this. Uh, come along, Morris. Just don't look at Mr. Fender like that. Yes, I know you didn't like him because he was so nasty to you. But you have the last laugh because you have nine lives and he only had one. Think she could have done it? Done what? The murder. What murder? All we know is we got a guy who's dead. Oh, but he said on the phone. Who said? You don't even know if it was Fender's voice you heard or if it was that he was telling the truth. Now, look. Let's wait till we have a case before we get all head up. Yes, Dicker, but if he wasn't murdered, then how could... Maybe he had a stroke or a heart attack. Maybe he was some kind of a nut. Hey, hey, Detective Trout, don't touch that body till the doc checks him out. You want to do something? Here. What? Chalk. Draw a picture of the way he's laying. Then let's you and me take a look-see if anything else is disturbed besides the late Mr. Fenton. Okay, Detective Trout, start her up. Where are we going? Back to the precinct. Uh, what about the homicide? Well, a guy died, that's all. Of what? Doc says a brain hemorrhage. But what caused it? He doesn't know. At least till an autopsy. Probably natural causes. I don't believe it. The man said on the telephone... Look, that... do me a favor, will you? Leave it lay. We got nothing to go on. No evidence of forcible entry. No evidence of robbery. Look at all the dough he had in the desk drawer. We could have checked out the other people in the house. I did that. Nobody home. Or at least not answering their bell. All right, come on, come on. Now, let's move it. You could tell by his face. What? His face. Mr. Fender's face. His eyes wide open like they were accusing whoever it was. I wonder how he was killed. Maybe somebody said boo to him too loud and frightened him to death. It isn't funny. No. Now, what is funny is a rookie detective who can't forget she's a woman and has to get big romantic notions of first case is murder one instead of some poor old geezer scared to death of dying but having to do it anyway. Now, come on. Let's not go looking for trouble, detective. You're going to find out plenty of it gets handed to us for free. I'm sorry, Sergeant. Ah, oh, don't mind me, kid. Doesn't matter how many times you look at one, I still don't like to see no one dead. Did... Did the doctor say anything about the mark on his eyelid? What? What mark on what? His eyes were open. How could you see a mark on the lid? It was creepy. The way he was staring and I tried to close his eyes. I just started to pull down the right eyelid. Then you wouldn't let me touch him. And there was a little mark there. What kind of mark? Well, just a little red mark. Like, uh, well, maybe somebody, something, bit him. I don't know. He jabbed a pencil by mistake or, or I don't know, something sharp. Maybe like, uh, you know, when you get a penicillin shot from the doctor. All right, take the next left, Trout, and hit that gas pedal. You can turn on the siren, too. Where are we going? The hospital. I want to have a talk with that doc and fast. Needle, huh? Well, you're, wait, you're, you're not thinking of Mrs. Applebaum's hat pin. What else? Oh, that nice little lady for what? A quarrel about heat or the plumbing or a, a cat? Let me tell you something, detective. Most murders are committed by nice people who just flip a screw suddenly and go berserk. Sometimes all it takes is a hot night. Or a sneeze, or the wrong words put together. No, sir. 
I mean, Miss Detective, the right time, the right place, the right circumstances, anyone can commit homicide. So you do think this is a homicide after all? I don't know, Trout. We'll let the doctor tell us that. The unmarked car hurtles through the city streets, traffic clearing for its wailing siren. In the passenger seat, Sergeant Digger Bowles is no longer relaxed, but sits forward as though driving himself. Beside him, Detective Marion Trout is tense and more than a little scared at the reaction to what her observant eyes have seen. I shall return shortly with Act Two. For many of us, death, the inevitable last rite, is a feast or sorrowing already arranged. But for countless others, it is the accident which was never expected, and there is nothing tidy about closing the house of life. Saul Fender, who was he? What was he? Who is left to mourn him? And most of all, how did he come to die? While Sergeant Digger Bowles and Detective Marion Trout wait at the hospital for the M.E.'s report, some of this is resolved. Where have you been, Sergeant? The autopsy room, waiting for results. Nothing yet. What'd you dig up? Mere sketchy, just a sort of outline. Draw it for me. Okay, Saul Fender was 67. No relatives, retired on Social Security. He got the basement apartment in return for servicing the building. His wife died a few years ago, and after that, I gather he didn't care too much about anything. He kind of died with her. Did he gamble? No sign of it. Other women? No, oh, come on. He was a sad little man all alone. He kept to himself, minded his own business, and like the old story, never did anyone no harm. Maybe. All right, the deceased is on the autopsy table. I got nothing to say until... All right, I'll take it. I said I'd be at this extension. Hello. Yeah, this is Detective Sergeant Bowles. Who's this? Oh, Dr. Baker. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, I see. Okay. I'll take it from here. So? So, score one for youth and an eagle eye. You got the makings of a detective. Maybe I was lucky I had you along. Uh-huh. The mark on his eyelid. Yeah. Somebody shoved something really skinny and sharp right through his eye socket and into his brain. That's what caused the hemorrhage and his death. So it was murder. That's about the size of it. Mm. You got your case after all. No, I have. I'm not sure I want it. That nice little old lady. Mrs. Applebaum? Yes. We still got to build something that'll hold up in court. Where do we start? Uh, it's after midnight. I'll have the house staked out tonight just in case. We start early in the morning. Okay, Trout, here we are. Scene of the crime. Everybody out. Okay. Where do we start, Sergeant? We're going to face Mrs. Applebaum first. Nope. We'll check out all the other suspects. The patrol car phoned in. They're all home. But first, we'll have a look at Fender's apartment. What for? That's what we're going to be looking to find out. Find anything here in the bedroom, detective? No, Sergeant. You find out anything. Yeah, a couple of things. I counted that money. $295. A lot of cash to have hanging around. Well, it makes some people feel secure. I mean, like to have cash on hand. Yeah. Two bank books, over 1,200 in one, 10,000 in the other. What's in the cigar box? Have a look. Smell. Mmm. Grass. Marijuana. Good stuff. Well, you think he was a dealer? Grass. Money, they go together, don't they? No, not necessarily. The entries in the big bank book are all years old. 
The money's been there since the year one, just gathering interest. Uh Uh-huh, and the new bank book. Chicken feed. A buyer, maybe. Not a seller. But I got a notion where this grass came from. Where? Yeah, this is his rent book. A character named Dreiser. You remember Mrs. Applebaum called him a person? The first floor back. Yeah, check. He was always behind in his rent, it seems. Sometimes the old boy carried him for two, three months. Why? He was a supplier? Or is that jumping to conclusions? That ain't jumping. That's just plain adding up two and two. Tell you what. Let's you and me go pay a visit to the first floor back. (laughs) Mr. Dreiser? Mr. Dreiser? Open up. Police. Hey, man, what goes with all the loud jive? I mean, like you're breaking my head. Here, Mr. Dreiser. Ooh, I am the one. Detective Sergeant Balls. This is my sidekick, Detective Trout. Real nice. Solid. The mama and the papa. What can old slats do for you? I'd like to ask you a few questions, Mr. Dreiser. Will you come in? Well, sure. Come on in. I'm clean. Uh, just a little stretched out. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got some coffee moving. You use some for what ails you? We haven't got anything that ails us. Oh, then you're lucky. You got it made, mamas and papas. Slats here, he's just cutting it. I mean, like just. Excuse me. Stoned. To the gills. And something a lot stronger than grass. You know it. I stay one side of him, be ready for anything. I guess you know what happened here last night, Mr. Dreiser. Oh, man. <laughs> Is that hot? Last night? Uh Uh-huh. To the superintendent. You know he's dead. He's what? Dead. How? Well, we're trying to find out. Well, don't look at me, man. I wasn't even here last night. Where were you? Well, now, that's no question for a doll to ask. I mean, you gotta protect your own doll, right? Uh, Mr. Slats, are you trying to say you were with a woman? (laughs) Ah, crazy. You named it. You want to give us her name? Why? Fender didn't just die. Someone killed him. Oh, wow. You're you're not looking at me. You were behind in your rent. Well, I was, but I paid up last night. What time? Well, just like before seven on my way out. Didn't show in his rent book. It was cash on the line, 295 bucks. Here, I got his receipt right here. Huh? Uh, That's a receipt, all right. But for what? I don't dig it. What was passing between you two besides grass? Any hard stuff? Hard stuff? What are you talking about, man? Junk? Yeah. Are you buying from Fender? Well, I'm no user. Well, what do you do? Push it? Sister, lay back. No call to come on so hard. I'm clean. Where were you last night around 9 o'clock? Well, like I said, with, with my old woman. What's your name? No, I wouldn't want to get her mixed up in nothing. Hey, what are you doing, Fuzz? Get out of that drawer. Hold it. No, you hold it. Don't you touch nothing of mine. There's one little item in here I wouldn't think of touching except to pick it up with my handkerchief. Do you mind if I borrow your ice pick? What do you want it for? I want to take it down to the morgue and see if it fits the hole above Saul Fender's eye. Where somebody drove something real sharp like this right into his brain. What? That's the way he died. Around nine o'clock last night. Now, you still want to clam up about where you were then? Man, I keep broadcasting. I couldn't have been here. How come? Because I was in Mount Pleasant then, 50 miles from here. Prove it. Come on, what kind of a roust is this? You ain't gonna make me take no fall for some murder rap. No, let's look at it this way, punk. Now, no, don't tell me you haven't done time. I dig deep enough, I'll tie you into junk peddling. So the old man found out, was gonna throw you out or turn you over to the cops, and you were on a trip and used this on it. No, no, I didn't. This ain't no ordinary ice pick. It's sharp as a needle. And what do you need it for with an electric refrigerator? This is a weapon, and you know it. Okay. Okay. I ain't standing still for being railroaded on no murder rap. 
I take a four, it's going to be for one to five. Not the whole bundle. There's a pump jockey in Mount Pleasant will remember me and get me off the hook. Why is that? Because I hit his gas station last night. At nine o'clock, he was backing off from that ice pick 50 miles from here. Okay. Put your wrist behind your back. That's it. How come you... You had a pick on me for handing Fender his ticket. Well, you seem the only one who might have a motive. You kidding? What about all the others? Well, what about him? Well, like old Professor Porter up there. Him and Fender used to be such great buddies. But last night, just as I was cutting out, he, he come on like a like a sore boil about something. When I left here, there was some kind of a brinigan going on. That was before seven. So how do you know where he was at nine? We'll check it out. An old lonely heart's dimby. There's a babe who's so hot for anything in pants, she even made a few passes at Fender. <laughs> and man, when he brushed her off, she was ready to total him. And how about Mother Applebaum, huh? I mean, like, she may look like Whistler's old lady, but there's one tough little cookie. Her and that hat pin of hers. What would she have against Mr. Fender? Babes, he hated cats. I mean, like, they turned them off all the way. And anybody don't like her means the old cat is marked right off her books. Let me tell you. Okay, okay, that's it. Move. We'll check them all out. Don't worry. Well, too bad it couldn't have been him. Hey there, babes. Cool it. Now you cool it. You're lucky you're just a two-bit crook. It just may save your life. the stone head back to the precinct while you check out Miss Dimby. You think he can handle it? Well, a dried up sex star, Fordish, would be sex kitten. I'll be a lot safer than you would. You can have her. I'll take the professor as soon as I get back, then we'll compare notes. I hope it turns out to be one of them. Why? Well, I like old Mrs. Applebaum. I don't want it to be her. Listen, detective. First thing you got to learn in this job is don't form any attachments. And the second is, don't kid yourself there's any romance. And forget all about the books, the movies, and the TV shows. The way it is in real life, 99 chances out of 100, the perpetrator is the obvious one. Which means Mrs. Applebaum. Which means Mrs. Applebaum. <laughs> have to be a very large or unexpected miracle to get Mrs. Apfelbaum off the hook, as Detective Marion Trout is due to find out when both her other suspects turn up with airtight alibis. And yet, uh, but that will have to remain till I return shortly with the third act. Right at this moment, Marion Trout is almost regretting her transfer to the detective bureau. As a uniformed policewoman, she has faced death before, but then it was impersonal, not something she had to become involved in. A murder investigation, she is finding, is different. Now, she herself is committed to hunting down a murderer that might be a bright, attractive old lady to whom she has taken a liking. But in spite of Sergeant Bowles' conviction, she doesn't have to face that yet. For the moment, her quarry is Miss Dimby. Who is it? Uh, sorry to bother you, Miss Dimby. I I'm a police officer. Oh, dear. Oh, dear me, you, you don't look like a police officer. Well, I should have said detective. My shield and identification. Oh, I... I, I don't know what to say. You haven't heard about your superintendent. Oh, you you mean about his heart attack? Mm. Oh, yes. So so sad. So sudden. It was a terrible shock. I, I felt so guilty about my my feeling of relief for the moment before I. Oh well, per perhaps you should come in. Thank you. Yes. Such a, a dreadful, dreadful shock. Mm. What did you mean? feeling of relief. Oh, well, I, I never should have mentioned it. it. It's just that it's so difficult for a, a young single girl to, 
to be in a house that's practically infested by men. Mm. One gets a little tired of, you know, being pestered. Mm. Particularly the older men. Although Mr. Fender was very sweet, but he was persistent. I, oh, well, one must speak well of the dead. Mm. <laughs> Won't you step into my parlor? Oh, thank you, Miss Denby. Oh, please, sit down. Oh, you, you don't mind if I go on with my knitting, do you? No. Not at all. Uh, well, I, uh, I have so many bows, you know, men in my life. Uh. So many favors to return, and I, I, I am not well to do, so I, I knit them scarves or, or gloves. Hmm. Did you know that Mr. Fender was murdered? Oh. Murdered? Oh, but, uh, but, uh, how? Well, he was stabbed. In the eye. Oh. Something very sharp was driven into his brain. How dreadful. What, what what sort of thing? Well, something like a skewer or an ice pick. Or a knitting needle. Oh. Miss Dimby, where were you last night between 8.30 and 9.30? Oh, why, I, 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 I was at a moving picture show. Ah, well, what did you see? Oh, why, it... Oh, it was lovely. Mm. So so artistic and, and cultural. The, uh, that exquisite production by the great Spanish director, Mikhail Lugano, La Paloma. Had you seen it? Oh, well, no. What theater? Oh, the, the fine arts. Oh, that beautiful little theater on the southwest uh, corner of Broadwalk and 24. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Yes, well, then you couldn't have been here anywhere near 9 o'clock. Oh, heavens, no. Well... In that case, there's no need to ask you any more questions. No, 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 no. Don't bother. I'll let myself out. Oh, well, uh, you're sure that's quite uh, uh, satisfactory? I'm sure, Miss Dimby. You gave me just what I need. Sergeant. Damn, Professor slipped out on me. What is it? You don't have to look any further. I've got her. Who? The murderer. The Dimby Dame? She gave me an alibi. That she was at a movie at the Fine Arts Theater at Boardwalk and 24th last night. I trapped her with the address and get this. She's a knitting nut. I don't follow. Now listen, there's no Fine Arts Theater at that address. It's just a hole in the ground for a new building and knitting needles. A steel knitting needle. Wouldn't that be a perfect weapon for a sex-starved old maid? To use against a guy who maybe turned her down. Oh, a police person? Uh, Miss Detective? Yes. C could I see you a moment, please? Go uh, ahead. I'll go with you. Oh, I I'd rather see the lady alone, please. I think I'd better come along. Oh, dear. Well, all right. Come, come in, please. I, uh, I, I'm afraid I have a confession to make. Well... You see, Sergeant? I, I lied to you earlier about being at the fine arts. You weren't at the movies? Oh, yes. I was at the movies, but not... Not at the one I said I was. Yes, well, then where were you? Well, I... It's really a matter of one, might say, morally outraged uh, curiosity. I had gone to, to see a perfectly dreadful and vile thing called uh, the story of W... Oh, well, I can see why you might have wanted to keep that a secret. That their story of W, detectives, is X-rated. It's what you call your hardcore pornography. You've got to be kidding. Well, what's the difference, Dimby, what you saw? Unless you could prove you were there. Oh, well, I, I can prove I was at the one. Oh. Well, the, uh, the manager knows me. It's a little embarrassing going right up to the... Well, he... he he lets me in quietly. And how long were you at this movie? From 7 to 11 o'clock. I'm afraid I, I... I sat through it twice. Glad you enjoyed it. Oh, you... You needn't look down your nose at me. And instead of harassing me with your... Your police brutality, you should be after the real culprit. Yes, and who's that? The almighty professor. Oh, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Always the gentleman. 
You should have heard him and Mr. Pender going at it, hammer and tongs as I did when I left for the, uh, when I went out. And something else. Ah, uh, what was that, ma'am? Well, the door was open as I passed, and I, I saw him hit Mr. Pender over the head. With what, Miss Dimby? With his umbrella. <laughs> But if you look at this umbrella, you can see he must have hit him pretty hard. Some of the ribs are broken. Well, first of all, we don't know it's his umbrella. She said she saw him throw it out this morning. She says. Anyway, so what? There wasn't a mark on Fender's head. How can you hurt anyone with a light umbrella? And anyways, the time is all wrong. Yeah, well, maybe he came back. Well, here's the amusement center. That's what I intend to find out. Now. Hey, excuse me, uh, Professor Porter? Morning. You want to play one dollar a game unless you win, and then I pay you two. Take board number seven and choose white or black. Hey, excuse me, I, I don't want to play. I want to talk to you. My credentials. Police, we can go over here by the weight machine. It's the quietest place in the house. Very well, uh, Sergeant. You you have exactly one minute. I gather you were a friend of Saul Fender's. Saul, yes, yes. We played chess together, and why? When was the last time you saw him? About 6.30 last night, when I went home for dinner before I returned here. What time did you return to work? It was sometime before 7. And you got home at 11.30? That's right. Between you... those hours, you were sitting at your usual place in the window playing chess. Except for traveling to and from. Yes. What happened to Saul? He was murdered. What? what do you, you, you don't think I had anything to do with it? Not if you were here at nine o'clock, no. You're out of it if you're telling the truth. And don't worry. I intend to make sure that's just what you're telling. Yeah? You sure? Yeah. Okay. Well, what did the lab say? No trace of blood on the hat pin. Well, that don't mean nothing. It could have been washed off. Uh, then you're going to arrest her? I don't know. We got motive, opportunity, means, but... Eh, ain't much of a case. No witnesses, no proof they quarreled. Yes, and yet we know Professor Porter did. What's the difference? That was two hours earlier, and he... What is it? I just thought of something. Who usually establishes the time of death? Well, the medical examiner or whatever doctor they send over. Only this time he didn't. We told him because of the phone call. But supposing by that time he was already dying and was only beginning to realize it. What are you talking about? I don't know. I'm going to get Doc Prouty at the hospital and maybe he can explain it to me. What, what are you... It's all right, Mr. Porter. Come on in. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> Oh, that policeman who came to see me. Who is this woman? This is Detective Trout. What you're doing here? Well, we want to ask you some questions. Yes, Mrs. Approbaum is quite correct. I did quarrel with my poor friend Saul. We had a terrible one. And you did hit him? I'm ashamed to say I did. I hit him over the head. With your umbrella? Yes, but... The provocation was very great. I ask you to imagine. My life is not much, but I have my pride. I could have been one of the greats. A Spassky, a Bobby Fisher. But I was never given the chance. Instead, I work in a window, playing with fools who have no hope of beating me. Goggled at by idiots from the street, as if I were in a cage at the zoo. But... When Saul came to the house, he was lonely. He had no companions. I taught him to play chess. 
I played with him to amuse him. I even showed him the unbeatable reply to the Museo Gambit, a secret only I know. And you know how he repaid me? Yesterday, knowing I was sick and not myself, when I had ten games going, he came, he, the pupil to the master, and used my own trick to defeat me in the goldfish bowl. He shamed me in front of all the world. I was mad enough to kill him. I'm afraid that's just what you did. What? Is this the umbrella you hit him with? What he, yes, yes, that's my umbrella. I threw it away because some of the ribs got broken. But that, well, a, a, a little hit on the head from a light umbrella couldn't have killed him. If only it did. One of these broken ribs jabbed straight into the hollow of his eye and right into his brain. Oh, no. No. I never meant... But wait a minute. You said he was alive at nine o'clock. We quarreled at least two hours before that. Sometimes it takes time for a man to die. The doctors tell us that the hemorrhage caused by the wound could easily have taken two hours to cause his final death. Good Lord. I... I suppose you're going to arrest me. The charge will be manslaughter. But we'll have to arrest you. But I don't care about the charge. I'm only sick to my soul that I, I could have caused another human being's death. I think... I shall have a better judge and a punishment to fit the crime. Mr. Porter, are you all right? No, my dear. I'm very far from all right. It's my heart. There are some pills in it. Oh, no. Which pocket, sir? It, it doesn't really matter. It's better this way. The end game is played out. This time it's... Checkmate. And I'm the loser. Some time ago, outside a New York bar, two men got into a fight. One of them lashed out at the other with an umbrella. After the fight was stopped... The man who had been hit by the umbrella continued on his night out. And it wasn't until he returned home some two hours later that he collapsed and died. Truth, as I said in the beginning, is stranger than fiction. Except when it is borrowed to make a good story. I'll be back shortly. I suppose the motives for the crime of homicide are countless. Some of them are as unspeakable and as savage as the crime itself. But the most macabre and terrible thing about it is that by far the most of them are so small and unreasonable, except to the people involved. How few of them are as neatly solved and resolved in the words of Genesis, a life for a life. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Our cast included Marion Haley, Robert Dryden, Court Benson, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.